uh, along with a, an image of me and I'll be using some gestures I suppose from time to time um, but uh, uh, as Holly has said not taking questions through the main part of the talk but do if you have any questions do put them in the chat and Holly will uh, corral them to the end of the, uh, uh, the, the, the event so first of all uh, this uh, you, you might think this is a big claim uh, that I've made that, that uh, ancient skills can transform modern mammal recording uh, but I hope to convince you of that in the next few minutes but first I'd better introduce myself so that you know what my justification is for, uh, for being here uh, you might have read in the in the blurb already I'm chair of Oxford Mammal Group but most importantly from this point of view I have a passion for track and sign Un unlike most of my colleagues who specialize in particular species I specialize in um, the identification interpretation of, of signs that animals leave behind uh, animals of all kinds in fact not just mammals but uh, today obviously we're focusing on mammals um, but I'm interested in, in also the signs of birds and even insects you'd be surprised you can uh, detect and identify them often also by the signs they leave behind uh, this you're probably most of you will be puzzled by this uh, reference to cyber tracker just let me explain that very briefly um, it is a scheme that was started off in Africa as a way of uh, judging uh, the abilities of different ind indigenous trackers because it was realized that um, uh, the indigenous peoples had a lot to offer in terms of supplying data for uh, for various research projects um, but the quality obviously varied and needed to be uh, a judge somehow so a guy called Louis Liebenberg came up with this uh, way of assessing people's skills uh, and then um, that that did well in Africa and uh, an American tracker called Mark Elbrock came across the scheme and took it to the States and now various people have brought it to Europe so uh, uh, there's currently uh, a, n a number of people working on cyber tracker basis in Europe and it's the only real generally approved way of comparing people's abilities um, you sh the the first level you can get is level one then you build up to level two level three it's rather like a sort of martial arts uh, belt uh, evaluation scheme uh, and so I'm now at level three uh, there's currently only I think four no five people in Europe who have a higher grading than that um, okay but I thoroughly recommend it if you have an interest in track and sign find out about cyber tracker get yourself on an evaluation don't be intimidated by it you will learn a lot just by being on the evaluation so uh, the thing about mammals is they're greatly under recorded I'm sure that everybody here uh, at this meeting recognizes the value of, of recording schemes um, but mammals are not uh, greatly under recorded largely because they're very good at not being seen um, but if you can detect the the signs that they've been there then you don't have to actually see the animal themselves um, just as a, a couple of examples I I did a I ran a workshop at the end of a three-day conference in Oxford uh, uh, last year a conference of field conservationists so they were all trained biologists um, but uh, at the end of the, the conference I said to them I bet none of you have seen a mammal whilst you've been here uh, other than maybe a squirrel uh, and they all agreed I took them out and within 50 yards of the lecture theatre uh, found incontrovertible evidence of five different mammals that have been present just around the lecture theatre there uh, taking in the whole campus it got up to eight mammals uh, in the course of uh, three quarters of an hour uh, so these were all experienced knowledgeable people 
but they had been totally unaware that all, all these were amongst them. Truly, they live among us. Uh, what is needed, though, in order to uh, transfer that into successful recording, obviously, is the reliability of the interpretation of the signs uh, and the, the observer needs to be sufficiently confident in his own ability, his or her ability to, to understand the signs and to recognise it. But I'm here to tell you that you can do this. You can start from now. There are some things you know already. I'm sure you'll recognise this. This is a molehill. Uh, but they're hardly ever recorded. Moles are incontrovertible evidence. Molehills are incontrovertible evidence that moles are present. Uh, so that's all you need. You're, you might go through your whole life without seeing a mole live, but you'll see plenty of molehills. So report them. But what more generally then do we need, mean by track and sign? Okay, here's my. Uh, little acronym screen uh, to, to kind of generalize the range of, uh, of potential things in track and sign. There's more things even than that, but I think I'm just going to leave that up for you to study whilst I'm talking for a while. Uh, uh, I think as you go through that, you real, begin to realize that the subject is actually probably a lot bigger than you thought it was a minute ago. You're probably thinking of footprints, but you probably didn't think of all these other uh, forms of sign that can be interpreted. So my aim today is to give you an overview of the subject, but also to equip you with a num number of tools and tips that will enable you to get started straight away. Um, but I must warn you that after this little intro section, uh, I'm going to be racing through quite a lot of material, so pay attention. And uh, whereas I would normally uh, perhaps be more, uh, go slightly slower because of being interactive with the audience, in this case, in order to keep things going, I'm not going to pause to ask any questions of the audience. Uh, I'm going to be answering my own questions if I ask anyone, if any ask, ask any at all. Um, but on the other hand, as I said before, if you do have any questions, if I haven't made something clear or, or if you just have a, 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 an auxiliary question, please do enter into the chat and I'll try to take care of it at the end. Uh, <clears throat> so, OK, I'm just going to give you a, a short example of the value of T at track and sign as well. Um, excuse me, just let me take a second. Um, A couple of years ago, there was a story in our local paper here in Oxford uh, about how uh, uh, wild boar had moved into the area and were, th were threatening uh, children and their dogs and uh, it was going to be chaos. And uh, I was curious about this because I knew there shouldn't be any wild boar. Uh, and I, uh, but the, the article gave clear description of of uh, where these sightings have been made. And so I, the next day I, I went to this uh, place and it turned out to be a little woodland, quite suitable habitat in a way. Um, and I spent uh, two or three hours uh, going around it and, and penetrating it, looking everywhere. It wasn't very big, so I was able to give it comprehensive coverage. And by the end of that time, I could be absolutely sure that there was no wild boar there. Um, not because I hadn't seen any or heard any, but because I hadn't found any signs. And it'd be impossible for wild boar to be living there without that me being able to find some sign of either footprints or a wallow or a back rub against a tree uh, or, or plowing of the ground uh, looking for grubs some of that evidence I would be have, have been bound to find. Because I didn't find any, I could be absolutely sure there was no wild boar. So uh, I uh, uh, wrote to the paper and um, sure enough, they, uh, they 
responded well and uh, published uh, my letter explaining why I knew that there was no bore there and the whole story was a mistake. This woman had clearly, what I did find was a, a lot of sign in the wood of, of Munt Jack and uh, Clearly, she must have spotted a young monk jack and thought it was a young boar. Uh, <clears throat> and I was able to put the whole story to bed. So that's the power of, of this, not only as an uh, indication of presence, but also an indication of absence, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. But so, okay, let's get down to business. The first thing everybody thinks about is footprints, so let's jump in by looking at uh, four of the most common prints that you might come across. <clears throat> some of you will recognise these straight away, some of you won't. So I'm not going to test you with questions, as I said. Uh, I'm just going to tell you that left to right, this is cat, badger, dog and fox. Um, but uh, I'm just going to get the annotate mode working here on my screen so I can make a few points. Okay, so the, the first thing I want you to, uh, to notice is that uh, uh, the, the cat stands out or should stand out to you by virtue of the fact that it has no uh, nail marks on the print. Uh, those of you who own cats will be familiar with the fact that um, cat claws are retractable and they keep them retracted uh, uh, except when they want to use them in anger really. Uh, so if you see a print on the ground Cats will very, very, very rarely show any nail marks. So you'll usually get this more or less symmetrical um, pattern of uh, of of uh, four. Um, sorry, just let me emphasise that this is the one I'm talking about now. So uh, you'll get this uh, the four toe pads and the uh, sort of palm pad. Um, behind those, or kind of surrounded by them. And the reason you need to know about cat and dog, of course, is because you need to eliminate uh, those from your inquiry, basically. You're not going to need to, in this country, or unlikely to need to report a wild cat. Um, if you were doing so, you wouldn't be doing it just on the basis of footprints alone. But anyway, you, you might need to uh, eliminate that from your inquiry. Uh, so the, let's move on to the next one. Uh, this big uh, this guy here, the badger. Um, now, the distinctive thing about badgers is that their toes are all in front of the palm pad uh, rather than sort of wrapped around it uh, like uh, as with as with most others they're more or less in a line in front of the palm pad um, just to explain the drawing there uh, the reason one toe is shown in that sort of uh, outline form is that often it won't show on the on the print itself that's the equivalent of the, the thumb, if you like, of our hand. Uh, and um, it's often held just aside and a bit up and in the badger. And uh, so it, it might well not register in a print. Um, so you might see four toes, you might see five on a, on a, on a badger print. The other remarkable thing is their, the length of their nails and, and how far in advance of their toe pads, their um, their nail marks are likely to be, uh, particularly on the front foot. Um, that, that's the one that's illustrated in that particular example. Uh, 
but even on the hind foot, they're, they're quite, quite surprisingly long nails. Uh, so, moving, up, moving on again uh, to, the, uh, to the dog, just to remind you, this is a okay, dog. Uh, and let's consider the dog and the fox actually together because they are both clearly, there's clearly a lot in common. They're both canids. Uh, so uh, they've got the same general shape. And this is really possibly the most important uh, uh, lesson for you to learn as a beginning tracker is the distinction between dog and fox because obviously you'll see a lot and a lot of dog uh, but um, uh, you you need to be able to pick out the odd fox that you see amongst that uh, and for I will come back to them in it again in just a moment but uh, for the moment just notice I try to emphasize with the way I've marked them there Notice that the general shape is different as well. I mean, the, the, the dog print tends to be vaguely circular in, it, in, it, in its total outline, uh, <clears throat> whereas the fox print tends to be much more like uh, elliptical or perhaps a teardrop. Um, yeah, I'll just... Uh, Let's just move on from this one uh, to the next uh, frame. Uh, looking back at the badger print for a moment, just compare that. I want you to compare that with the next slide, which shows actual badger feet. OK, so these are actually a pair of rear badger feet, uh, hind badger feet if you like, um, from a unfortunately a, a, a roadkill badger that I came across uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, the reason I'm including it is just to help you um, get a, a grasp of how the formation of the feet dictates the formation of the, uh, the print that is left on the ground. And uh, you can see uh, here the, uh, let me see, I'll just do something here. Um, this this great uh, large palm pad here, um, that's the, that's what gives that big sort of kidney shape on, on the print. And uh, you'll no, notice that there you've got those four toes printing well in front of that. But you can see also how this little toe here, which is in fact, as I say, equivalent to our thumb, you can see why that might not give uh, a very good print. Um, what I'd also like you to think about for a moment, just uh, perhaps looking at your your own hand, uh, then uh, if you think about it, if you if you look at the palm of your hand, you're seeing the equivalent of that picture that's in front of you on the screen now. But if you put that, if you put your hand on the ground as if you were putting your weight on it then obviously the thumb changes from being uh, on the right hand side of, of your right hand to being on the left hand side of your right hand, if you see what I mean. Uh, and that can cause a little confusion, but you just need to try and get that sorted in your head. Okay then, uh, let's move back again to, or on again to uh, consideration of dog and fox in more detail. So now we're going to look at uh, uh, some these real prints. 
real examples of prints that I photographed in, um, I was lucky enough to find them close together. So the, 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 the uh, substrate, as we call it, the, the ground surface was very similar. Um, so you get a, a proper realistic sense about um, the uh, amount of uh, how, how they're going to be, how they're going to compare in terms of, you know, because it's not just the shape of the foot, but also the weight they're putting on it and everything else. So, uh, over on the left hand side, we've got the dog. Uh, and on the right hand side of your screen is the fox. And I'm going to run through a number of different factors that distinguish these two um, prints. Uh, it might seem like overkill with the number of factors. You might think, oh, I can see the difference. Well, but often the print is incomplete or, or it's under difficult circumstances. So it's very useful to have a number of things to refer to. Okay, I'm going to draw some uh, some stuff on here. First of all, let's just take a bit of freeform uh, wiggly line here. So I want you to notice that uh, first of all, we talked about the general shape. I think you can recognise that one's more circular, one's more elliptical. Then look at the, uh, the, the toe pads are uh, pretty similar. Um, the, often the, the dog ones look slightly more bulbous and pumped up. Uh, but in particular, the palm pad in the dog, if you can follow my line here, goes around sort of sorry we'll do a, a smooth line in this system but occupies a space something like that whereas the palm pad of the fox <laughs> is more like that um, if you forgive the wiggly line you'll see that my the main thing I want to draw your attention to is the relative size so one good guideline is that the palm pad of the fox is scarcely different, often just the same in fact, as uh, in size as the palm, as the uh, toe pads of the fox. Uh, whereas with the dog, um, it can, it will be two to three times the size of the individual toe pads. Uh, just get those lines out of the way. Then um, let me just draw your attention to the nails. They are marked. So if you look at, uh, uh, they don't all show on all prints, but if you look at the ones that do show, you see that one there for the dog compared with that one there for the fox. See how different they are in size. The, the uh, dog has big blunt claws which almost always register and you can there's a bit of a trouble with the substrate there but you can see it you can certainly see that one you can certainly see that one uh, the fox are much more discreet they're slimmer they're more dainty all, 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 all concerned uh, you, you can make a couple of them out but but uh, it's, yeah, much more dainty. Uh, then look at the, um, uh, the, the amount of negative space we call it. Um, again, if I just put this highlight back here so you can see the front end of that and see the the front end of this. Then I think you can now see that this space, that the, the, in the dog's case, uh, the toe pads really sort of 
cluster around the uh, the palm pad. Whereas in the case of the fox, you get this large vacant area between all the pads, uh, which we call negative space. And uh, often if you look very closely at that, depending on the substrate, if it's good mud or whatever, you'll often see, be able to see quite clearly the hairs because foxes have particularly hairy feet. Okay, just clear that out of the way. And now let's just look at this. Um, if, if I try to draw, let's get the straight line thing going. If I draw a line from this point to this point, which are the, the sort of front ends, if you like, of the, uh, the outside toe pads. If I do the same thing over here, you'll notice that with the dog, it really cuts across the image of the front two toe pads. Whereas with the fox, it sort of skims behind them. You can often draw a, a, a clear line without touching either side as it were, in that case. And finally, if you do the same sort of thing here, you can oops, draw two clear lines through through the gaps there with no trouble at all. In this case, in the dump, this dog case, uh, you, in this particular example, you can almost do it, um, except that, again, if I just highlight where this front edge is, it's just coming up to sort of that sort of area. Uh, so, uh, you, you, you generate, or oh, you, the way this, this is the mnemonic here is that there's an X in Fox. This, so if you can draw an X like that, uh, it's pretty, pretty good chance you've got a Fox print. Um, the comparable mnemonic for a dog, I just again uh, get rid of some of this stuff, uh, go to freehand. A dog, the negative space looks more like that shape, and you can you can consider that an H for hound. There's a lot of these little mnemonics that come up. Some of them invented by me. Some of them traditional. They're, well. Well, very useful because uh, there's so much to learn. You need to have this knowledge at your fingertips. Okay, so, so far we've been looking at animals with paws, but what about deer? Um, so these are the four deer that you're most likely to, to meet in the UK. Um, the thing about deer, they're ungulates, so effectively they walk on their fingernails. Um, it's effectively the, the two front fingers that co constitute the hoof of a deer. Um, and uh, again, without uh, testing you, as you probably know, the, the, the four common, more, more common deer in, uh, in the UK from left to right here are in size order, Munt Jack, Roe, Fallow, and Red Deer. Um, and uh, although again, there's uh, important extra detail that you can learn over time, I'm gonna give you this very simple rule of thumb, or in this case, actually rule of finger to get you going with these. And that is that if, um, if you look at the Munt Jack, uh, 
uh, and just make it 100% clear what I mean. You look at that height there, that length. Um, I find, uh, if you look at the, the picture of me on the screen at the moment, that this, it, this first joint of my index finger is longer, slightly longer than a muntjac print. So if uh, I would expect a muntjac print to be slightly less than that first joint. If it's slightly more than that first joint in length, then it's probably a roe deer. If it's the length of both of those first joints together, are you seeing that? Both of those joints together, uh, that would be about the right length for a fallow deer. And if it's longer than that, so about two and a half joints, shall we say, then that's going to be a red deer. Okay, I know that's uh, it's an oversimplified analysis, but it's a good start. A um, couple of other things that are worth looking for are, are Munt Jacks, for some reason, are almost always asymmetrical. If you look at the two parts of the hoof, they don't usually match. There's usually one that's slightly longer than the other, slightly curved over the other. Uh, roe deer are usually very symmetrical. In fact, they often, if you, if you look at the whole thing of the two parts together, the whole shape is like a heart shape upside down. Um, the uh, uh, okay, let's leave, leave it there. That's probably enough detail of that for the moment. Sorry. Uh, okay, let's move on to some other real cases. This, uh, I hope you can all, you'll all spot straight away, I hope, or fairly straight away, but uh, down here, we've got a nice little badger print. Uh, again, you, you can uh, just about see the image of the, of the, the thumb showing on this case. Um, but uh, but nothing like uh, as clearly as the other four toes. Um, but uh, what you might not have seen is if you look up here, you can see him on the way home, uh, coming back in the opposite direction. Uh, I was particularly pleased with this this pair of thymes because they were right in the center of the city, um, city of Oxford, uh, just in a little, tiny little muddy, muddy puddle on a pavement in one of the busy streets. And I was walking the past and it caught my eye. And again, absolute proof that they live among us. So let's have a look at this and normally I would set this as a, as a sort of question but the um, question is, is it a dog or a fox? Uh, the point it really is to get you used to the fact that things in the real world can look quite different to the examples that you see in textbooks um, depending on the substrate and so forth. Uh, in this case you know, it's a bit sort of smeared and smudged out because it's uh, um, it's obviously slipped a bit as it's uh, as it's stood in this mud, or walked across this mud, trotted across the mud. Uh, but nevertheless, if you analyse it in the way I've just told you, uh, I think you can clearly see that uh, this um, palm pad is only about the same size as the toe pads. You can draw a pretty good line through there. You can draw a line through there, through there. Uh, and if you 
uh, if you look at uh, this area here, sorry, I haven't done that very well. Um, this negative space here, I think you can even at this um, on your screen, it's probably now, um, you can probably see the traces of hair in, in that negative space. So, uh, and there's no sign of the big uh, doggy claws either. So, very confident that it's a frog. Okay, sometimes uh, it's, it's not just the, uh, the footprints themselves, but the total trail that they make together that uh, is distinctive. Have a look at these. <coughs> so obviously these are symbolic uh, references, but, uh, but I think you can see what's going on here. Well, let me explain at least that uh, uh, in both cases, the direction of travel is like that. It's going up the page, as it were. Um, and to put you out of your misery, if, if, you're, if you are struggling, uh, these on the left are, is a rabbit and on the right is squirrel. And you can probably gather that, again, I haven't done it very But that is a set of four prints. Uh, but what you might not be immediately um, able to understand is that, as is often the case uh, with, with tracking, uh, the front feet are actually at the back, and the back feet land, end up landing in front of the, of the front feet. So as the rabbit goes along, and this is the point in, in real life where I would normally do a, a clumsy uh, demonstration in front of you, but obviously it's not possible here, but uh, the front feet land and then the back feet come to either side past the front feet and, and land ahead of the front feet. Uh, squirrel does almost the same thing except because its uh, anatomy is slightly different its front feet land together side by side and then the back feet come which sorry I haven't done it very well again the back feet come in front of the uh, in front land up in front of the front feet if you imagine a, in your mind a, a squirrel um, crossing an open space, I think you can understand how that would work. Um, but both of those uh, trails are, are really quite distinctive in terms of, in this country anyway. Um, the rabbit, hares can also leave that sort of uh, uh, pattern, um, although they also use other patterns as well um, but uh, but yes rabbit or hare and and squirrel gray squirrel red squirrel produce very similar patterns okay so some real life examples yeah so again you might not even see the individual footprints but but you can see a trail here you can see that something's gone down here in fact, if you do look closely, you will see there is a print there, there is a print there. But uh, from the uh, surrounding territory, you can see that it's, it's prob it, this is a gap between, it's picking a gap between trees, which isn't constrained for height. So it's probably a tallish animal. In fact, in this case, it was a roe deer um, in the woods. And again, sometimes uh, you, you can see uh, 
you can sense the trail without seeing the individual prints. Um, in this next slide, I'm going to show you. I was very pleased with myself that I figured out uh, uh, a route that an otter was taking to get between a lake and the canal. Uh, and uh, I was very pleased with finding the route, traced it down, and there it goes through that space. And then I realized that I wasn't the first person to have spotted this. Um, somebody's already set up trail cameras. And uh, finally, in this section, also, here's a typical badger situation. We've got a wooden fence there. Um, Badgers are never going to be put off by a wooden fence like that. They're always going to dig their way underneath it. If, if that was their accustomed route, they're going to keep going that way. Uh, but in this case, because there's a barbed wire fence as well, you can clearly see here that they've left, the badger has left his calling card. He's got a bit of hair snagged on the, on the barbed wire. And if I was able to show you that in close up, you would see the distinctive badger hair format uh, of um, changing from dark to light to dark in. So weather can have a big effect, of course. Um, for instance, snow can uh, conceal a lot, but it can also reveal a lot. So in this case, you can see that there's an obvious trail there hard to identify what's been putting its feet there until if you look along the trail for a space which might be in this case uh, probably this one here where the snow is a little bit thinner you're likely to get a better uh, clearer print and in this case it turns out to be a cat um, Another example, another obvious trail, again, hard to differentiate until you look at that one, say, and then you look closely at that, you find it's a road here. Um, you can see the, the arrow pointing to the right of it, where the, the arrow of the foot. Um, As I say, sometimes it's the trail. And here you can see a very clear squirrel trail galloping across this car park <coughs> into the trees at the far side. Now, moving on. These holes in the ground will be recognizable immediately to many of you as uh, symbolic of a badger set. And um, so it's, but it's time now to give you the, uh, to introduce you to the Bob Cowley Simplified Guide to Holes in the Ground. Part <laughs> one, magic paper. So try, try and do this uh, to, the, to the camera here. But, so if you take an ordinary piece of A4 paper, that is about the right size. I hope you're seeing it there. Uh, that piece of paper is about the right size for if you were making the front door to a, to a badger's house. Um, but note the badgery shape, that uh, arched roof and very flat surface because they're very flat to the ground. Okay. If you fold this paper now in half, that is about the right size for if you're making a front door for a fox. And if, if you fold it again, that's about right for a rabbit. Obviously, this is a simplified guide and uh, animals are very well known for using each other's burrows and adapting them and so on. So, it may be that something was dug by a badger, but now being taken over by rabbit. Uh, they might even be using it at the same time. This is not unknown. Uh, but 
that's a good start. Um, on the other hand, don't think that it's only badgers that can produce a huge amount of spoil heat, do a lot of digging. Look at this. Uh, you can just about see the hole at the top, which is a rabbit hole. But immense amount of uh, spoil that they've dug out from the earth there because it was a sandy sort of environment, they were able to do it well. How do I know it's rabbit? Because of that, those four prints there, showing a rabbit moving towards us. Uh, so what if you find a smaller hole? like this one uh, then you have to move on to um, part two of Bob Cowley's Simplified Guide to Holes in the Ground which is the magic fingers uh, so I'm try and get this in the right place for the camera here we are okay so if you put your fingers together like that the space that they go through is a four finger hole, you got three finger hole, two finger hole, one finger hole. Okay, so this, as it turns out, is a three finger hole. Uh, four fingers would imply a rat or a water bowl three fingers like this one implies mole two fingers is probably bank wood boat, wood wood mouse or bank bowl and one finger is a usually some kind of insect but that's a whole different lecture so uh if um one thing i want to stress though is that a hole doesn't necess isn't necessarily made intentionally by the animal uh, in this case, if you find a hole in a path like this, a well-trodden path, it's often a sign that there's a tunnel underneath that has partially collapsed through to uh, uh, the, uh, being worn by the traffic over, over the top. So that's what's happened here. So if you felt inside the hole, feel it both ways, you'll be able to detect that there's a run going in across the path. Uh, and if it was, uh, if it decays further, it ends up with something like this, where the whole tunnel collapse starts to collapse, and you can see how that links into that string of uh, mole hills on the right. Uh, but it's not just uh, not just moles. Here's another hole in another path, and in this case, it's a two-finger hole. So this is a wood mouse or a bank roll. In this case, it's a bank roll. Uh, here's another. Uh, and this is a bank roll. And this is actually his entrance. Uh, and how do I know it's a bank roll? Well, there's a few different reasons. But uh, one of the giveaways is this nut here, which has been opened in a particular way, which is characteristic of bank rolls. But haven't got time to go into that uh, today, but you can tell a lot by discarded nuts. But of course, uh, not all animals, not all mammals live in the ground. Some live in nests. So this is a squirrel dray. Uh, note that uh, the squirrels, when they make a nest, tend to leave all the leaves on the twigs that they're using, unlike uh, birds, which usually use clean twigs. And so that's one of the distinctive factors. The other thing is it tends to be sort of spherical rather than flat, so they then just burrow inside it. But watch out for confusion with other things like magpie nests, which are also tend to be domed, uh, but also odd growths of trees can look misleading sometimes. That's about the largest uh, mammal nest you'll find. This is about the smallest. This is a uh, harvest mouse nest. 
it's just in a tussock of long grass and that nest is small enough to, to fit inside a tennis ball and here if I can just do this carefully okay there there is one in the palm of my hand uh, it's getting a bit fragile now because I've had it too long um, but uh, uh, they're charming little uh, constructions uh, very hard to find because they blend in so well with the grasses around them um, anyway the another kind of thing that of course all trackers are obsessed with uh, is scat or dung or droppings or whatever word you're comfortable with so here is uh, coming up on the screen in a moment I hope yeah there we go uh, this is fox scat typical position uh, slightly raised uh, at the side of a path or trackway or in this case a road very common place um, foxes like to advertise uh, so I, 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 I tend to categorize three different kinds of animals with, uh, with regard to scat there's those that like to advertise those that want to hide it away and those that just don't care one way or the other uh, foxes are definitely in the advertising business as you can see from this example where one has taken the trouble to climb on top of a grit bin in a busy street in order to make his deposit um, and here in a different context where the ground was very very flat and managed to find this little bit of raised ground to put it on the idea obviously is that uh, uh, if it's uh, slightly raised it will catch the wind um, it, it acts as an advertisement to say to other foxes I'm here this is my territory that sort of thing um, interestingly badgers are also in the advertising business but take an entirely different strategy they dig a little hole in the ground usually to, to deposit in um, but they still leave it exposed and uh, I think the reasoning there is a fox scat might be exposed but it's also exposed to the weather it's going to get washed away relatively quickly whereas a badger latrine pit is going to retain the dung and, and it's going to stay as a marker there for a long time it's a great territorial marker okay th this is uh, roe deer droppings um, it's funny I thought we were going to do something else as you can tell I'm slightly non plus there okay uh, this is roe deer droppings and uh, uh, all deer droppings are, are kind of similar but again they fluctuate in size so that's a guideline but one of the distinctive things about uh, deer droppings is they usually have a, a point at one end if you look at that one there for instance um, and they have a kind of a, a cavity or a concave bit at the other end if you look at this one there for instance you can prop, I hope you can see that uh, little dent we call this pimple and dimple um, and it's a very distinctive characteristic of, uh, of deer droppings ah there's a rabbit okay so rabbit uh, also like to advertise um, so this one's put on this bit of high ground it obviously uses it regularly as a, a territory marker um, but uh, they also you do scatter them willy-nilly here and there as well as, you, as I'm sure you know so, yeah. here's another advertiser slightly different this is um, otter sprint so uh, so special that it has its own name so there it is absolutely typical location at the water's edge uh, 
often on a hard surface, so it uh, remains remain obvious for a while. Um, and very useful because you can analyze what, uh, what, the, what that's been eating as well. But in this case, you can plainly see what this uh, otter has been eating. So we're moving on to feeding signs now. They're not all as obvious as this. This is really a big fish that the otter has caught and utterly demolished. But this, in this case, you can't even see the uh, ingredients at all, but you can clearly recognize the devastation that has been wrought by badger or, or a team of badgers perhaps um, hunting for worms and grubs in this particular area. This is another feeding sign. I, it's not the best of photographs, um, but uh, this is an old tree stump with some broken nutshells on top of it. Uh, squirrels often do this, have a sort of feeding table so that they can keep a good view out, look out whilst they are eating. Here's another kind of feeding sign or two examples. Clearly birds have died here, but one's been killed by a, a, a mammal, but the other's been killed by a bird. Um, the one on the left is a typical sparrowhawk kill. The, the, uh, the, the feathers are plucked out individually and scattered to the wind, as it were, so they cover a bit of an area. Uh, a mammal uh, plucking takes a different attitude, particularly uh, typically a, a, a fox or a cat. If you look at uh, this area here, you can see or just about see, I think, uh, a bunch of feathers that have, have come out in one chunk. So they they nibble across a wing, say, and uh, the feathers remain sort of stuck together by by the saliva and so on. So if you find that the, 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 the quills have been sliced off and if some of them are stuck together like that, that's very characteristic of a, of a mammal quill. Uh, this isn't exactly a feeding sign. This is uh, what happens next. This is it. This is actually the remains of an owl pellet. You'll see it more clearly. I'll put the ruler up on it. Uh, focuses the attention. This is this has been in the woods for some time and it started to disintegrate. Um, but you can clearly see the, uh, the the bones, the broken bones inside it, and bits of fur and stuff. Um, Sorry, some of you might not be familiar with the idea of bird pellets, uh, but uh, they're most famously owl pellets, but also other birds do it as well. Uh, they regurgitate the hard products that they can't digest. Um, and when it's straight out, uh, out of the, uh, the bird, it looks more like that. It has a solid lump, easily mistaken for faeces, um, but more, usually has this sort of more rounded shape that uh, it comes up from the um, the bird's throat. Uh, and the great thing is that if we take one of these we can break it apart and analyse the contents uh, and see what the bird has been eating and that tell, gives us a good indication of what mammals and other things are in the area. Um, so this is how it looks when it comes in, and this is how it looks after my wife has been uh, analysing it under the microscope and breaking it into its constituent parts. Um, so she's, uh, this is what I call pellet sushi. Um, she's put all the, all the skulls and jaw bones in there for me to analyse. All the other mammal bones are in here. And then this one's full of all the uh, unidentifiable fur and other stuff. But just looking quickly at the skulls there, you can see that that looks like a, a rat and a vole and a shrew. I'd have to look more closely to decide what vole and what shrew, but, uh, but even, even from this 
distance, as it were. It's giving a lot of interesting information. This is uh, uh, a death of a different kind. This is, um, if you look closely down here, you will see the skull of a ro male roe deer with its antlers still on. Um, unfortunately, it failed to clear this barbed wire fence and clearly its leg got stuck and I'm afraid it must have starved and bled to death, which is obviously horrible and very unfortunate from the deer's point of view. It did give me this uh, rather nice skull. All the rest of the bones as well. So I now have a complete kit of a complete roe deer kit for them to play with. Okay, finally, uh, we're getting to the end here, not before time. Um, just a word of encouragement that you might find you go out and you don't see anything identifiable or clearly identifiable for a long time, but stick with it. I was having one of those days this on this particular occasion. Uh, I hadn't seen anything interesting for about half an hour or more. And then suddenly I turned the corner and I saw this badger latrine. And then I looked across and I saw this otter feeding station. And then just here, uh, yeah, there's squirrel nuts. So three clear signs within a two meter distance of each other. And that's the way it goes sometimes. Uh, so uh, I hope this has uh, whetted your appetite for the subject. Uh, and that next time you take a walk, you'll find yourself recognising some of these things and adding to the interest of the walk. More specifically, I hope that I've proved my case that uh, this can transform mammal recording. And so please do start recording these things. Don't worry about all the stuff that you don't know. Concentrate on what you do know. Um, you can start with molehills, squirrel drays, badger latrines, otter spraying. If you're not yet confident about foxes' footprints, how about deer slots? Stick to those things and contribute to our, our knowledge. Uh, so, any questions? I hope uh, already there might be various things lined up with Holly. Um, but uh, if you don't get the chance to ask me now, or if you think of something later, or uh, you just want to know more, please don't hesitate to email me anytime. That's the best way to contact me. Um, and I will be very glad to hear from any of you. So, Thanks very good. much, Bob. We've got a few questions in the chat already. Good. I'll start reading through those now. Um, we had one earlier asking, is there any way to distinguish between rabbit and hare footprints? The footprints, well, uh, obviously the first thing is that hares are slightly bigger than rabbits um, so the individual footprints which I didn't actually discuss in detail the, the individual footprints of the of the rabbit but um, the hare prints are slightly bigger than the rabbit prints um, the classic uh, statement is that if you take a, a print of the forefoot of an animal that's either a rabbit or a hare. And if you take an old fashioned matchbox and put it on the print, matchbox ought to completely cover the rabbit print, but the hare print will be slightly bigger and show on either side. Um, there are other subtleties in terms of the, the, the relative position of the, the thumb, as it were, on, on, the, on the thing, but that that's, that's requires a lot more detail and study. Brilliant, thank you. Um, someone else was asking, uh, concerning the gait pattern, are fox tracks always more linear than dog tracks? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, 
I mean, dogs, as, as anybody who's ever seen a dog will know, it wanders off this way and then runs off that way and is easily distracted by different scents or sights that's going on around it. A fox is much more businesslike. It knows where it wants to go and it, and it basically tends to take a straight line across a field. Um, this, this particularly is another thing that shows up very clearly if you get a snow, snowfall overnight and you go out and have a look at a field at, uh, in the morning. Well, thank you. Uh, Mike was asking, do you have any tips on cleaning skulls and bones? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, yeah, I do, um, but probably this isn't the time to go into it because it, it does require quite a lot of consideration. There's different ways of handling different things. Um, there's a, there is various information on the, on the internet um, there are also various tricks that I've come up with my own. Um, we should discuss that somewhere else, probably. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Mike, I'll send around Bob's email around after this so you can get in touch and ask, ask that way instead. Um, we've also had a couple of questions regarding recording. Uh, where should records be submitted? And uh, for beginners, how do you suggest they start out recording with tracks and signs? Okay, well, uh, all right. I suppose number one is start somehow. Uh, but uh, the question of exactly who you start with, there's various uh, formats in which you can make records, particularly with regard to mammals. The Mammal Society uh, has its own uh, format called Mammal Mapper. Um, but there is... Uh, Probably the easiest um, way to go, I would say, is iRecord, um, which is available either as an app or available online uh, by computer. Um, if you just uh, Google the letter I and the word record, I-R-E-C-O-R-D, all in one spasm, as it were, then uh, you'll very easily find it. It's run by the British... Uh, Biological Record Centre, uh, and you can put records of any sort there, whether it's uh, butterflies or, or mammals or whatever. Um, and so it's nice to have it all in one place. And the other thing that I like, really like about it is that it's then immediately accessible to all the local record centres um, who can use that information if it's relevant to some planning application, for instance, if the uh, presence of badgers or water bowls or something might be important. Uh, it's also easy for you to go online and look back on your records and compare them to other people's records and, and just have it all in one place so that you can uh, review it. Brilliant, thank you. We had a question from Sarah asking, do you have any suggestions for resources and books that can help with track and sign skills? Well, yeah, the, the last time I counted, um, I had more than 60 books on my shelf, um, just about tracks and signs. Uh, that's, not, that's, that's not the ones about mammals in general or uh, biology or, or natural history, those are just the tracks and signs from, from around the world. Um, th this, is, this is my, uh, my latest bedside book um, that keeps me busy. Uh, as you can see fr from the, the front, it's, um, it's, it's, it's written in Dutch. Um, 540 pages, that's just about tracks, not about signs at all, it's just about footprints. Uh, and it's only about um, UK and, and Northern European mammals. Uh, no, not, 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 not just mammals, all, all kinds of footprints, mammals, birds and so forth. But, but 540 pages of Dutch. Uh, it, it's a struggle, um, but it's fantastic. R written by a friend of mine called Rene Lauter. And, uh, but if you, for a starter, you can't do any better, and this isn't just because they're hosting this um, scene, but you can't do anything better 
then the FSC guide to tracts and signs of, of mammals. Um, this is a, a wonderful, uh, I expect most of you are familiar with this series that they do on different, all sorts of different things. Um, but it's made of weatherproof card and it folds out and, and it has really a summary of all the basic tracts that you're likely to find in Britain together with some other useful information about, about scat and so on and even the, the, the nut stuff that I wasn't able to get into today. So yeah, I would say for a beginner, that's your first go-to. Um, Great. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, promo there, Bob. That's very kind of you. Um, I'm just, I'm aware we're overrunning slightly. So if anyone does need to head off, then feel free to do so. We are recording this so you can catch up on anything you miss afterwards. I will try and go through a few more questions. Yeah, I'm sorry I overran. No, 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 don't worry about it. I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, okay, we've got a question from Pam. She was asking, uh, what's the difference between mink droppings and otter spraying? Sorry, mink droppings and otter spraying? Yeah. Uh, okay, that's a good one. Um, uh, the otter spray tends to be slightly larger, and in particular, when I say larger, I mean a, a sort of larger boar, shall we say, a, a, a thicker, um, just because it's a slightly bigger animal. But the main difference is in the smell. Uh, that's the most obvious thing that uh, uh, otter spray. Um, is quite uh, famous for having quite a pleasant smell, um, which has been tried, described in various ways. Most commonly described as smelling like jasmine tea, um, which improbable though it sounds, is pretty, pretty accurate. Uh, on the other hand, mink absolutely doesn't smell pleasant at all. It's the, absolutely the opposite of pleasant, whatever that word is. Um, <laughs> It, 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 uh, it is really at the foulest end of, of the scat uh, smell spectrum. So, um, so that alone will almost always tell you. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Can't remember who that was off, but you'll have to go and start smelling it. I think it was Pal now. Um, right, I think I'll squeeze in one more question. Um... Oh, there's a question asking, can you tell the sex of badgers from their footprints? Ah. Okay. Uh, yes and no, I suppose. Uh, we've all probably heard stories or seen examples of, you know, the uh, indigenous trackers uh, studying something and saying, oh yes, this, this was a uh, a, a male leopard or a, a female lion or whatever. Um, to some extent that is possible. Uh, there are size differences in the animals and so on, but of course there are also size differences due to age and so on and so forth. Uh, there are also questions, suggestions that are made that um, what we call what we call in the tracking business the straddle, that is to say the uh, the perceived width between the left and right prints uh, of a of a trail, and can be it is suggested that generally female animals tend to have a wider straddle than uh, male animals, but again that varies with the speed that they're travelling at and so on and so forth. So all in all, I would tend to say, uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's probably something that you don't want to bother with for your first 10 years of tracking or so. That's fair enough. Right, I think we will finish now. So thank you for joining us today, Bob. It's been really interesting and you've had some uh, really good tips and tricks to share with us. Um, I'll send around those links in the chat to everyone as well and Bob's email if you do have any more questions. Um, Bob also teaches 
uh, track and sign courses for us at the FSC as well once things back to normal. So keep an eye out for those. Obviously, they've got postponed this year. Um, but yeah, big thank you to Bob for joining us and thank you to all of, uh, you as well for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed it and hopefully we'll see you all soon. So bye everyone. Thank you everybody.